views expressed on this program are those of the hosts, guests, and callers, and are not necessarily those of this station, its management, or other advertisers. You're listening to Transformation Talk Radio. Are you ready to stop stress, anxiety, and low self-esteem from running your life? Join award-winning author Dr. Friedemann Schaub from Empowerment Radio as he addresses some of the most prevailing challenges in our day-to-day lives. Find out how you can use the power of your mind to overcome self-sabotaging patterns and build a solid foundation of confidence and self-respect. Learn cutting-edge tools and approach every day with great ease, joy, and purpose. This is the time to empower yourself. Now, here's your host, Dr. Friedemann Schaub. Welcome to Empowerment Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Friedman. And as always on Wednesdays, we are talking about different interesting topics, challenging subjects, and discuss how we can learn from each other, how we can use the information that's available to us to go through life in a more empowered, in a more centered, in a more positive way. And for that, I often invite guests, guests that have something interesting to share. And the guest of today has a lot of interesting information to share, and I'm really excited to have him. But let me just have a little introduction on the topic, because what we're going to talk about is, I call it the, is it time for a heart care revolution? Now, as many of you may know, I have been in cardiology in my previous life before I went into research and then doing what I'm doing now, helping people through the power of their minds to help their healing system to get on track, to change their perceptions on themselves, to overcome limiting beliefs and also release any kind of negative emotional baggage from their past. And just to mention it quickly before I go on, if you are interested in finding out more about my work, just go to thefearandanxietysolution.com. Now, when I was in medicine, I think one of the things that really bothered me was how little time we had for the patients. I was in a big university hospital in the cardiology department, and we had like five minutes, 10 minutes max per patient. And it always felt to me just too short to really know what was going on with a person. And so I, I read a book by a Swiss physician, which... Uh, he was called Tournier. And this Tournier in the 40s, 1940s, had written about his uh, experience with patients. And he said that some of the most difficult cases he had, where people just didn't make any headway, nothing really changed, he often invited to those um, he called um, fireplace dinners, where he basically had a little dinner with them after work. He chatted with them and then sitting by the fireplace, maybe drinking some nice wine, they got into more of the story of the person and what was really going on and and what he found, and that's what he actually was famous for then also in the medical community, that these conversations often seem to accomplish so much more than anything that he could prescribe to those people and that just being able to open up and speak their truth, talk about what's going on in their lives, help them to somehow get in touch with healing potential that he and also his patients didn't know was really there. And then often their healing paths shifted and and they got well. I have witnessed similar, uh, yeah, wonderful healing um, episodes with many of my clients and patients. And, and I find there is something about the mind-body connection that was, in my time in cardiology, completely underappreciated. Now, this was in the 90s, and my head of the department often refuted the idea that 
being a type A person or having a lot of stress could really have a negative impact on the heart. Now, these days we know how stress can really affect the heart and we know more and more about the mind-body connection. So from my end, I do believe there is a healthcare, heart care revolution on the way and certainly necessary, which would include to have more time with a patient, to talk more about their circumstances, to get to know more what is really the mind telling the body and the body telling the mind to see the whole system much more in the holistic context, which I believe originally medicine was all about. Now, this is my little yeah, corner of the healthcare revolution. And I'm excited that more and more physicians and healthcare practitioners are on board and, and also agree with me and, and collaborate with me in this regard. Now, my guest today has a whole different approach to the healthcare revolution, and his information is just flat out fascinating. I could say he is like the Tesla of cardiology because he has done so many things in his life and he has created so many breakthrough inventions that I believe he will eventually be known for revolutionary for his revolutionary approach to cardiology and revolutionizing uh, healthcare in that regard. But there is one caveat. There is one issue that we're going to talk more about throughout the show, but let me just bring him on first. Dr. Gerald Buckberg is a cardiac surgeon and a researcher whose landmark procedures are used now by 85% of surgeons in the U.S. and nearly that many worldwide. And we're going to talk more about what those landmark procedures were about. And he has more breakthroughs that he has developed throughout the years that he writes about in his groundbreaking book, Solving the Mysteries of Heart Disease, or, and that's a caveat, how life-saving answers get ignored by the medical establishment. Why on earth is that possible? And that's something we're going to address through our conversation here. But first of all, let me bring him on. Thank you, Dr. Beckberg, for being here and taking the time to talk with us about what you have found out throughout your years. Thank you, Freeman. It's, a, it's an honor to be here with you and uh, have a chance to chat with you. So thank you for inviting me. Now, you have been in cardiology and in this field for how many years now? About 50, 55 years. And is it true that you still find new things about the heart that at the beginning you had no clue about? You always will. The world is a, is a world of curiosity. And curiosity and, means uh-huh. you ask a question, and that leads to another question. So the beauty is you're always asking questions and finding new things. And are you also okay sometimes to be wrong and find out that there is something better than what you thought would be available before? Well, the secret of finding new questions is understanding that in the quest to answer a question, you'll always have failure. Mm. And the, the, the gauge of somebody who does that is to overcome that failure to find the right answer. And so, and so you never, ever enter something with a smooth course finding an endpoint. It just, it just doesn't happen. There are always unanswered questions you must uh, uncover, answer, solve, show other people, and help them understand them. Well, that is a wonderful approach for life in general, I think. So thank you for sharing that. But I think your first challenge or your first answer that you found that made you in many ways famous was something that's still used in most cardiology or cardiosurgeon uh, operation rooms. Tell us about that, how you found out how to make operating on a heart so much more easy and safer than it was done before. Well, you know, it's interesting you bring this up because you, when you brought up what you were talking about, you talked about having a, a heart care revolution. Right. And the revolution you have to have is understand failure and find solutions. 
unless you begin with the point of understanding you're not always successful, you'll never make the changes that are so essential to solve the problem you're confronting. And the question you're asking about, uh, about how you protect the heart during heart surgery is a, is a beautiful one because as cardiac surgeons, we only have two jobs. The first one is to make sure we do the operation precisely right. We have to have technical expertise. The second is you can't hurt the heart while you're doing it. You can't start with a heart that's having a problem, fix it mechanically, and find it works worse you finish than when you started. Hmm. You've got you to uncover the reason this didn't happen. And this is a very fascinating phenomenon because the surgeons involved in, in, in cardiac surgery in a different way than other physicians are because we do something. And the consequence of what we do is to make the patient better or potentially worse. Mm -hmm. If the patient is worse, our obligation is to find out what we didn't do correctly to make him better. You might say that my, uh, my life is built on, on two principles. The first is that you have to discover failure. And the second is you have to find solutions. Right. And, and as we deal with cardiac surgery, we found that no matter how perfectly we can operate on somebody, something the heart doesn't do as well as you'd like, them to, like it to do. And you have to go through the scheme of learning what you did, how what you did may have hurt the heart, how to change it, how to implement something that will make the heart better. And that's exactly the scheme that I, that I went through in, in, in discovering how to stop the heart. And, of course, you have to pre appreciate that <clears throat> as, a, uh, as a surgeon, it's very difficult to operate on a heart that's, that's moving and, and, and writhing. Absolutely. You have, heart, you have to have a heart quiet, flaccid, so you can put precise stitches in. And in doing that, you have to take away the heart's blood supply. But if you took the heart's blood supply away without any form of protection, the heart has progressive damage. So you have to find a safe way to take away the heart's blood supply, then restart it and have the heart functionally as good as you've converted it uh, mechanically as a surgeon. And those are, our, those are our really two goals. And it's very fascinating when I did this, I encountered this when I was a medical student, at, at, uh, not a medical student, but as an intern at Johns Hopkins and at UCLA, and I, I had to find a way to do it. And I finally figured out a way we can change everything. And I thought I'd made the greatest contribution in the world when I presented my work at a big meeting in New York. And uh, when I sat down, there was a big ovation a German physician got up uh, and he said he didn't understand what I was talking about. You can do it much more easily. And that was a very fascinating thing for me because you, you're confronted with what you apparently think is great success. And uh -huh. someone says it isn't. Someone says it isn't. Now, what do you do? Do you defend what you did yesterday or walk into tomorrow? Well, well we got to talk about this after the break. That's an interesting question to ask. What are you doing when you're facing this dilemma that someone just told you, well, sorry, it's not as great as you thought you are, <laughs> that invention is not really what you hoped for would change everything. But let's hold that thought. We'll be right back after the break. Okay. Do you believe you are meant to live with more joy, but you're just not sure how to get it? What does the phrase, give me the joy, make you feel? Join me, Lynn Horde, every second and fourth Thursday, 9am Pacific, 12pm Eastern, on the Gimme the Joy Show, as I take you on a journey to peel back the layers so you can take back your joy. To find out more about my work as the Joy Coach, including my popular programs, Joy School and Joy at Work, visit lynnhorde.com. 
tap into the wisdom of animals, angels, and masters with Darcy Pariso on Animal Soul Wisdom Radio. Tune in monthly as Darcy brings insights on how to better understand and deepen our relationships with animals. Working with light and pureness of ancient techniques, Darcy, healer, animal communicator, and medium is here to guide you through this process and provide inspiration to move forward. For more information about working with Darcy, visit DarcyPariso.com. A space of allowing radio with Coach Nancy Coco, welcoming all that wants to be present today. Tune in Thursdays every first and third week at 9 a.m. Pacific on TransformationTalkRadio.com as Coach Nancy helps you find a space of allowing. Join Coach Nancy to explore what lives at your edges and to bring more of yourself home. For more information, visit NancyCocoCoaching.com. Hi, I'm Barbara Scheidegger, clinical hypnotherapist and founder of Swiss Hypnotherapy. And this is a tip with purpose. When the old anger and stress are triggered, stop, breathe, see what you're doing and tell yourself no more. Breathe and walk away. See your anger for what it really is. It's quite destructive. Don't take excuses for excuses. Take more of, yes, I can, and move forward. I hope this tip helps you going through the day today. You can reach me at 323-999-4775 or at my website at theswisshypnotherapy.com and write me an email and I give 30 minutes free consultation. Hypnotherapy is there for you. Demystifying the journey on From Here to There Radio with your host, Diane Garris. Tune in every third Wednesday, 4 p.m. Pacific Time on TransformationTalkRadio.com as Diane helps you get from where you are now to the life you envision. Get ready to get unstuck and move forward. Every show features a new special segment, New Age Notes, demystifying hot metaphysical topics of the day. For more information or to work with Diane, visit DianeGarris.com. Welcome back to Empowerment Radio. I am here with the fascinating Dr. Gerald Buckberg, and we are talking about his groundbreaking invention to have the heart stopped during surgery, during heart surgery, in a way that the surgeon has a much easier time to do fine stitches and the work without creating more damage than there was in the first place. But he just said that when he actually had made the discovery and presented it at a big meeting, there was a guy from Germany of all places standing up and saying, well, why do you do it this way? We have a much better way. And so Jerry had to face a failure. He had to face the fact that he was actually not the one that had the best idea. How did you deal with that? Well, I think you can say it's an incompleteness. Failure may not be the right word because we had done a good job, Mm -hmm. but it was incomplete. And he said that instead of using a lot of different methods that I had developed to to treat the heart more safely, you had to put a solution into the heart called cardioplegia. Cardio means heart. Plegia means stop. And he said, you can use this. And I said, well, that's an interesting thing. And I had to then confront a very interesting position in my life. I just spent three or four years developing a solution after which in one moment, someone told me I was incomplete. Mm -hmm. And my choice was to defend what I did or to understand there's something better. And 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 I really believe that the world is always made out of curiosity. It means there's a question an answer and another question. So I I went to solve what the problem was. And it was a it was, it was a very fascinating journey. It was almost like a, a journey of a of a, a discovery, of an adventure. And I, I won't go into all the details there in the book and anybody who has a chance to read it might 
be fascinated with the time course of what of what happened. But but we uh, we decided that there's something very fascinating about medicine and life, and that thing that's fascinating is called nature. And if you think about what we do as, as surgeons or as physicians, we encounter disease, and our job is to um, change disease by creating normality. But how do you create normality if you don't know what normality is? It's a vacant thing. Well, the normality is very simple. If I put a needle into your artery or your vein, I draw blood out. So why would we want to give a patient water solution when God said give him blood solution? Mm. <laughs> it, it, it's, so, it's so obvious, it's, it's astounding. And, and when I found that out, we developed a solution that, that, that worked. And uh, the way it developed was kind of interesting because I, I was with a, um, a surgeon in Alabama named John Kirkland, a very famous cardiac surgeon. And he said that, you know, if I, if I do something with the heart and take the blood supply away and I open the blood supply back again, the heart gets very sick. And that means if something happens when you give the blood supply back, it injures the heart. And I said, that's really fascinating. And we looked into that, and it turns out that you not only can use the solution to help the heart, but you can use it in the beginning to nourish the heart, to give back some of the things that it's lost because it's been injured. It's like nourishing a sick, a sick animal with nutrients. And then when you finish the operation, you have to realize that no matter how perfect you thought you were, you never were. You, you, you only thought you were perfect, but there are parts that didn't get protected. But yet you have another another tool in your gun. You have another bullet. And you can you can change the way you reperfuse the heart, the way you give the blood back to the heart in a certain way. So we developed this combination of stopping the heart more safely, keeping it quiet more safely, and reperfusing. And it's been it's been an, an amazing discovery. Because discoveries you make for one thing, like the heart, are never unique. Because the same problem in reperfusing the heart, we've been able to show you can do this with the lung, with the liver, with the kidney, mm. the brain, with the extremity. You could change things that you thought were completely lost by understanding how nature made things abnormal and how you can use your knowledge of that abnormality to draw together forces that were disturbed to make it better. And, and, and that is part of the, uh, the exciting adventure of my life is to, is to go from one phase like the blood cardioplasia to understanding how to do something with the lung to understanding how to do something with the extremity, which a couple of my students did. Do something with the liver, doing something, it, it, doing something with other areas, and it's just been a, a a great escapade of learning, growing, and teaching. But you do all these things, and you introduce these new patterns, and no one wants to listen. Well, that's something that I find very interesting. But before we go there, I want to go back to two things you said. One was that you were not going into the ego and feeling like defensive about your initial inventions. And the second one was that you instead were continuously curious, which I find fascinating because a lot of people would probably either feel deflated or go onto the more stubborn track and saying, well, you know, what I'm doing is just fine. You have no ego, or how did you actually get out of that way? Was the bigger goal, the bigger purpose, what was driving you? I think your your, your concept is hubris, <laughs> which uh, is a very uh, common concept these days. I don't, I don't think ego, you know, and I'll give you a, a little sidelight example of this, which I think is 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 I don't know if it's true. Uh huh. It's my reasoning that. As I mentioned to you before, we as surgeons go in on operation with a 
with the idea of, of fixing a mechanical lesion and making the heart better. And if the heart's not better, we want to make it better because we have what's called a participatory involvement in that operation. Mm. We're not just watching it. We're part of it. If you deal with other injuries like heart attack, heart failure, stroke, you have an observer environment. The physicians are fabulous in the way they try to teach their and, and help their patients, but they didn't have anything to do with that illness. Mm -hmm. So they don't have the internal drive to find a solution because part of that problem is the patient's problem. Part of our problem is the patient's and the cardiac surgeon's problem. Do I make any sense? Absolutely, absolutely. So you just feel or you felt just more invested maybe than others in regards to the reasoning why you wanted to find a solution. I mean, it was really literally dear to your heart to find it and it didn't really matter if you were right in the first place or not. And again, I feel like that there is something inside of you that you are also teaching by example, which is that curiosity and and that openness, you know, this openness to learn from nature. I think part of what, yeah. uh, from my experience at least, drove me a little bit away from allopathic medicine was that it often didn't listen to nature and that there was a sense of we have to not look at nature, we have to look at chemistry or we have to look at the pharmaceutical responses and not necessarily... Yeah investigate so what does nature already do well and how do we potentially interfere with its ability to heal itself and i think you had a complete different approach in nature you know there's a man we may talk about later in the, the man who created this amazing way that the heart is formed and he he made this wonderful comment to me that that was just so so uh, impelling He said, Gerald, he says, nature is simple. Scientists are complicated. <laughs> it, it, it's, so, it's such a beautiful comment. And, you know, it gets at, at one of mine is, is my, my favorite comment in the world is, elegance is simplicity. Confusion is complexity. And the Where's, answer is uh -huh. nature has simple answers. But you have to have the... Curiosity, the education, the intuitiveness, the, the uh, intellect, and the judgment to try to find its answers. But the answers are all there. They're gorgeous. They're beautiful. They're simple. And they're helpful. And when you, when you uncover these, you've uncovered the majesty of life. And if somebody doesn't believe it, that's their problem because they will. Their resistance has nothing to do with truth. It has to do with rigidity. And the rigidity is the barrier to new knowledge and growth. And, and the rigidity is why you said heart care revolution. <laughs> heart care revolution means you have to accept the failures of what you do and find how to make them better. Right. And until you do that, you expend life, you expend expenses, you ruin families, you do so many things because you think you're doing the right job, but you must be willing to not follow what somebody else does, but listen to them. And I, I remember very vividly when I was a... When I was a uh, Hold that thought. We're just going to go quickly to break and we'll just go yeah. then right back to what you started. Mm -hmm. Stay tuned. Do you know 
how to achieve wellness in all areas of your life? Hi, I'm Mary Jane Mack. Signs of wellness are a capacity to love and ability to nurture, a sense of purpose, a good sense of humor and plenty of fun in your life, a concern for others and a respect for the environment, a conscious commitment to personal excellence, a sense of balance and integrated lifestyle, and capacity to cope with whatever life presents. Well, people enjoy their lives and want them to last as long as possible. That's why the wellness mindset usually accompanies other constructive healthy lifestyle habits. By adopting a wellness mindset, and behaviors like eating well, taking the right nutrition for the body, exercising, and saying affirmations are just a few things to structure a healthy system of values and beliefs. I will be your wellness coach to help you achieve a wellness lifestyle. Call us at 888-777-4232. That's 888-777-4232. And visit us at maryjanemack.com. Ignite your inner magic on Grow Your Soul Radio with Jane Matanga. Tune in each month on Transformation Talk Radio as host Jane Matanga explores how to overcome your fears to help you gain the inspiration you need to awaken your path to joy. Learn the way to life mastery and the enlightened path with Grow Your Soul Radio. For more information on Jane Matanga and her work, visit enlightened-path.com. Conscious Confidence Radio, a timeless wisdom with Sarah Main. Tune in each month on Transformation Talk Radio and join Sarah on an adventurous journey to the deeper level of meaning to move beyond today's world of constant change, confusion, and uncertainty beyond the shadow of fear. This hit show explores key concepts such as confidence, values, and attitude in a dynamic way. To learn more about Sarah and her work, visit sarahmain.com. Hi, I'm Steve Kramer of Spirit Fire Radio, and I believe that meditation changes everything. It leads us in the direction of greater well-being, and that's a fact. I struggled with meditation for years. I understood the principles, but I found it hard to incorporate them into my everyday life. Spirit Fire's meditation practice changed that. It's called the Practice of Living Awareness, and it's taught in 14 steps. These are 14 tools that I can use in any moment on and off the cushion. Steps like smile, flow, and ground of being support my clarity of mind while I'm navigating the ups and downs of modern life. That's why it's called the practice of living awareness. If you'd like to add meditation to your daily experience, the practice of living awareness is free, online, and it's suited for any level of practitioner. Visit spiritfire.com for more information. And be sure to check out Spirit Fire's meditation retreats in Western Massachusetts. It's all there at spiritfire.com. Welcome back to Empowerment Radio. I'm talking with Dr. Gerald Buckberg about not only surgery and cardiology, but really about life. Because I think everything that you have discovered through your work can also be applied to living in itself, living in a way that is observing, that is accepting that there are questions to be asked, things to be done better, curiosity that drives us, a sense of the greater good that can be ultimately the motivation for all of us. In some ways, you are an example of how to live maybe in a much more conscious and holistic way than uh, we have been, especially more recently. Are you aware of that, that you're actually a, a life philosophy teacher in this regard, just looking at what you have accomplished and how you were going about all of your life's work? No, I think I'm just human. (laughs) <laughs> okay. <laughs> but you said something really interesting, which is about that rigidity and that sense that, you know, we are not necessarily open to new ways of looking at it. In the break, I ask you, so why is it that often in the medical establishment, there is a, a closeness to new ideas? And we talk about then also your ideas that were simply rejected And your answer is what? I think it's fear of not being the dominant force. The dominant force is never you, it's truth. It has nothing to do 
with who the professor is, who the mm-hmm. chairman is. It has to do what with what is what is actually true. There's a great story that I always remember when I was a pre medical student. I went to uh, uh, many different schools to be interviewed to see if they um, if they would accept me because they you know it was very hard to get in medical school then. And one question that was asked was intriguing. It was called, what book did you read that you liked? And the book that I read that I loved was called uh, uh, The Cry and the Covenant by Morton Thompson. It was a book by, about a man named Ignac Philate Semmelweis, who was a, uh, who was a uh, um, obstetrician in Budapest. Mm-hmm. He noticed that many women that came in to have babies would die of, of childbed fever. It was called purple sepsis. And he couldn't figure out why they were dying. And so he then did a little bit more of a study, and he found out the women that died were delivered by the doctors. And the women that lived were delivered by the midwives. And he said, how could that be? So he worked with his medical students and realized that what the doctors had done is they examined their patients, delivered the babies, walked across the street, did the autopsy, wiped their hands off because there's no germ theory and went back and infected all the women. Mm. And he said, wash your hands. Well, the titans of medicine went ape bird with this. <laughs> I'll use different terms, but they went crazy. And they castigated him, and he eventually died without knowing what he was right or wrong. But you see, these are these titans that that castigated him are exactly the titans that govern our cardiovascular field today. And they govern the future because they won't change. And they won't accept the, the failure of current treatment of heart attack, heart failure, sudden death, and six or eight more things I have listed in the book, which we've solved, because they think what they're doing is right because they're in charge. They're not in charge. Truth is in charge. And that's the interesting thing about your book, that this is not just, you know, an idea that you had that says, well, this could solve it. I mean, you proved it. You did uh, studies on it. You have solid research on a lot of things. I mean, you know, when we think about, for example, after heart attacks, and you actually have a way to help people to avoid lasting injuries in heart attacks, you have found a way for CPR to be extended out of, you know, just 15 minutes to, I think, uh, over an hour, right? I mean, you have found... Yes, you can do that, but you have to do other things. You have to accept that CPR is step one in treatment. It's not the whole treatment. In other words... Exactly, exactly. Walk beyond, walk beyond what you do today to learn about tomorrow. And But what, what you showed is that what can be avoided are brain injuries and brain damage. What yes. you showed is what can be avoided is sudden death, which is a very common phenomenon. You showed also in your work that pacemakers can be set in much uh, better places and be much yes. more efficient. And Now, my question for you is you presented this data to the quote-unquote titans, and what happened? Poof. <laughs> <laughs> they disappeared or you disappeared? <laughs> they, disappeared. they didn't respond. They, they, they were just closed mouth and it was stupid. Uh, I'll, give you a, I'll give you a very interesting statistics. This is, a, this is the most astounding statistics I think that I have to show you the, the narrowness of conventional thinking. If you look at the allocation of funds of the NIH to deal with diseases, they allocate funds to different diseases based on the number of patient deaths. And in neoplasm, there are about 750,000 deaths a year. They allocate $7,000 per death. There are many neoplasms that are currently untreatable. 
you look at cardiovascular disease, stroke, and uh, not stroke, but uh, heart failure and, and, and um, heart attack, and forget about stroke. And, and these have major problems that I talk about in the book, which we've solved. And they allocate $4,000 per patient for yeah. taking care of these things. You get a sudden death where the operative mortality today is 90%, 90%. And we have a way of saving 80% of these people with no strokes. The allocation of funds for this treatment is $61. And is that because they just gave up to the idea that there is any hope for finding a solution or because not that many people are dying or what's the reason? No, all, all the people are dying. The, the, mortality, the mortality. But I mean, the number, the number is not that high of... Uh, oh, no, no, there, there, there are uh, 450,000 sudden deaths in the United States. So how come that there is not so much money allocated? Because they have to change what they do. It's hmm. the rigidity of change. You can't treat sudden death with CPR. If, 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 if somebody was sitting next to you and they suddenly died, they were normal, they were talking with you, they died. And you brought the CPR team in, you gave them CPR, and 90% of them be dead. That means your treatment isn't any good. Right. And what else you could do is you could then put them on a little fem fem bypass to support the circulation. Find out that sudden death is not a disease; it's a symptom of a cardiac disease. So you have to find the cardiac disease and treat it, and we've done it. But but the but there is not acceptance of this uh, of this approach, and it's 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 frustrating. We uh, we did something which was. Uh, Utterly extraordinary. We we expanded this to to um, treating people that had been without brain blood supply for thirty minutes, and everybody believes at at five minutes of no brain blood supply you're dead. And we can get these animals to be normal in thirty minutes. And we submitted to the NIH, and they said that's not very interesting. That's not very interesting. Yeah. Nobody in the universe ever did this before. And they said, it's not very interesting. These are the titans that think they know everything. Uh, I mean, I'm just wondering, like, so it's not interesting to save actually brain uh, tissue uh, that usually, you know, I'm I'm really uh, curious about this because in my family, there was a, a little boy that fell in the pool and that was basically drowning in the pool at the age of two and now has severe brain damage. And right. so this could have been maybe a, a way to save him and save him from that severe brain damage, what you're talking about. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes, it may have been. It's, it's just, it's just the, the point is that people don't want to add on new things they have to do. And you, you retain the rigidity of thinking what you're doing is okay. In other words, you can, you can accept that what you do let's say, helps 80% of people. Mm -hmm. My point is that why are 20% of people not doing well? Right. Well, my question is entirely different. Well, what I'm wondering is, for you, does that mean you are just keeping on knocking on doors? You are just continuing doing your research? Obviously, it sounds to me that you have uncovered that our healthcare system is lacking behind. There are solutions that are ignored while always, you know, new drugs get pushed onto the market and there are already five others out there that do just as good as a job. But then, you know, there is maybe more money to be made. But in the end, what's, what's your approach and to solve that, to solve the issue that real life prolonging, real solution for better healthcare simply get somehow pushed under the carpet? Well, that's, of course, the age-old question. I mean, no one, no one's ever been able to answer that since uh, Galileo was only justified 500 years later. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, so no one knows the answer to that question. But I, I think that what you have to really do is realize that, that this is a time of a revolution. 
But a revolution isn't like Brexit, mm-hmm. where you're not sure what you're going to do. You're just going to change what happened before. Right. But I'm I'm introducing absolute solutions. Not I'm not I'm not, I'm not talking about I don't like it. I'm saying here's how you change it and make it work. And I think I my hope is my hope is that 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 people will read the book and say to, say to themselves, gee, here's a problem that has a solution. Why aren't we thinking about this? And they go to their friends and they say, do you know this problem has a solution? Look at it. Maybe, maybe you can you can think about it with me. And go to the doctor and say, you know, here's a problem when my mother-in-law and my father-in-law passed away and there's a potential solution. If you don't know about it, maybe you read about it. Maybe you learn something. And I, and I turned around one day and I said to myself, there's something quite fascinating in the United States. When I looked at Parkland, Florida, when I saw 17 children or 17 people in a school were gunned down and the Republicans and the Democrats and Trump didn't want to change anything. Mm-hmm. But the students said, that's wrong. We have to change the gun laws. And so the students in Parkland, Florida, changed the gun laws for Florida for 17 people that died. But I think people have to realize that the patients are now the students. And there are millions of people that are succumbing or getting sicker mm-hmm. because the, 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 salute, the, the problem you have is recognize failure, find solutions. You must look for the solution. You can't just look at the failure. And so I, I, don't, I don't know how to answer your question. No, I, I think you answered the question very well. But it is about, you know, just like these students in Parkland, they empowered themselves. They said, we will not be ignored. We're going to go to the streets. We're going to make some demonstrations happen. And we're going to get our voice listened to. Now, the problem in medicine is that the patient is disempowered as it is. We as patients do often feel like, well, the doctors and the whole medical establishment, well, they know better. They are in charge. I mean, when you really already see the distance between the the physician, which always bothered me as a physician, and the patient, there there is not really an equal relationship. A patient doesn't feel like I'm in charge of my health. It feels like the doctor is in charge of the health. Plus the problem with, I also believe the the cost of health care, that you don't really want to think about health care. You don't want to think about getting ill because it's just a nightmare and it's extremely expensive. So it's one of those issues that you just better ignore. And I think we as you know, the people probably need to find a way to be more empowered with allopathic medicine, medicine, uh, medical establishment, and and make our voices more heard. And and I cannot find uh, right now a, a better way than to read your book, the solving the mysteries of heart disease, to get educated and and really learn more about what's already known, what you have found. I mean, one of the things that you describe in the book is also about the shape of the heart, which is. I, I remember from my times in medicine that I was also taught exactly that what the establishment believes. But this this man that you met, this uh, Paco Torin Guasp or whatever, I mean, I, I probably butcher his name, but he made this amazing discovery. Tell us about it because I think it's a, it's, it's really a great story. It's probably the greatest discovery in the history of medicine. I, I truly believe that he's on a par with William Harvey who discovered the circulation. Because mm. Harvey discovered that there was a circulation. Right. Paco discovered how it worked. And he created this magnificent simplicity. I, I find there are three uh, momentous experiences of simplicity that I have encountered in my life. E equals MC squared by Einstein. Mass equals force time acceleration by Newton. 
and the hearts are wrap and a helix by Paco Turing Wasp. He's created the simplicity of the heart. And once you understand this, you understand most of the diseases we can't treat. And you can come up with treatments for them because you understand what's wrong and how you have to deal with it. It's, 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 it's the most awesome thing that's ever happened to me. And, 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 and it's a very interesting experience with him because <clears throat> apropos to what you mentioned before about, about my discovery of cardioplegia, I went over to, to Spain one time to lecture about how to fix the heart for heart failure. And we were doing some operations in Barcelona. You know, a man said, you want to meet this man who knows about anatomy? You know anything about it? I said, not very much. Be happy to meet him. So I went to this uh, place called Alicante and we met and I told him something. He says, you don't know anything about the heart, do you? <laughs> I, mean, you know, I, was, I was 35 years in, in medicine. He told me I know anything about the heart. You know, right? you know what? He was right. And I, and I went to his house and I canceled the trip and I stayed for 48 hours and we talked for 48 hours. I mean, we didn't sleep. We just talked. And I realized that he had uncovered something that was just miraculous. But it had to be proven. You know, you can, you can uncover anything in the world you think is miraculous, but it doesn't mean anything until you prove it. You know, I, I always say that, that the key of curiosity is, is to open a room with new ideas, test them with ongoing change as you learn. It's a process of learning. And I had to answer a lot of questions over two or three years, and I did. And I think it's the most remarkable discovery, and it will change the entire, the entire uh, landscape of how we look at the heart. Now, the look, heart was seen more as what? Like a, it was deduction. We, right. You, you spend your life with deduction. Deduction means nothing. It's a guess. Mm-hmm. You need evidence. You, you right. can't have a deduction, have a guess. I wrote an article that, that the major journals wouldn't touch because I, I questioned 10 things that we considered absolute truths, which are wrong. They're wrong. It's not, are they wrong? They're wrong because, because I can prove what's right. By, by examination, by, by, by demonstrating evidence. So his, his contribution is, 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 is the seeds of a whole new universe because what he did is brought a new idea to the world. And, and what, what in the world is greater than to feed a new idea into it? Especially a revolutionary idea that can change so much. And I think from that, what you wrote in the book, it can really answer a lot of questions about heart failure. And as I mentioned before, the positioning of the pacemakers and how the heart works in general. So it's it's a very fascinating story. Definitely something I can uh, highly recommend to read in your book. Now, Well, how do you finance your whole, I mean, you are in a quest, you're still doing research, you're still working, or have you stopped doing this research? Well, the, the, the quest was, was financed by the NIH. Mm. You know, the NIH wouldn't give us money when we found that animals that were dead for 30 minutes were alive. So we had to close our laboratory, and then I just began to write and ask questions. And I decided to write this book. And I hope that that interviews that I'm having with you and other people can get people to gather their own interests to to learn more about this mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and and to begin to ask new questions because the you know the, people always say to me a question that's asked me frequently are you angry because so many things you've done have been successful but not believed right and i no i'm never angry because my anger engenders discomfort with me and anger from another person what i want to do is really get them to open their minds and think about a problem 
right. to recognize things aren't right and that there is a way to make them better. Mm-hmm. And, and you, have, you, you really have to, uh, my, my mother used to say, your work has to have meaning. And, and if, it's, if it has meaning, then people will learn from it. And, and the gift you give to others is your gift. Well, what a huge gift you're giving, and I hope it's going to get unwrapped and utilized as long as, uh, you know, you're still living and it doesn't happen to you like it happened to this person in Romania, I believe you said, where or where is it, Budapest? Yes, yes and Budapest, yes. So I encourage all the listeners to be a part of that revolution. And again, revolutions, like you said, doesn't have to be violent it doesn't have to be negative it can be solution based but you and your book have certainly offered many solutions and are also me as a cardiologist opening my eyes and my mind and uh, i am uh, very excited about what's possible and i hope that we all together can bring your inventions into the hospitals and operating rooms and into the more mainstream approaches because they do save lives and they can make a huge difference. So thank you so much for your contribution. Thank you so much for just people being so open, curious, and committed to helping people and and finding solutions through nature and being such a wonderful example on how to approach all of that and staying still committed without anger without hurt and just that drive to continue. So I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. And thank you so much for inviting me to speak with you. How can people find out more about you? Where can they go? Well, I think they can go to geraldbuckberg.com. I think that's the uh, the website. Good. So that's Gerald, G-E-R-A-L-D, B-U-C-K-B-E-R-G.com. Yes, and the book, again, is called Solving the Mysteries of Heart Disease and can probably get anywhere and everywhere purchased. It came out in June, as far as I know, and uh, I really wish you great success with it and that that revolution will occur. Thank you very much. It was a wonderful time with you, and thank you for listening to Empowerment Radio. We are running out of time, so I better end. Until next time, goodbye. You've been listening to Empowerment Radio with Dr. Friedemann Schaub. Join Dr. Friedemann the first and third Wednesday each month at 11 a.m. Pacific as he addresses some of the most prevailing challenges of our daily lives. Discover how you can use the power of your mind to overcome stress, anxiety, and overwhelm and create a solid foundation of confidence and self-esteem. Learn cutting-edge tools so that you can approach every day with great ease, joy, and purpose. To learn more about what Dr. Schaub can do for you, visit the fearandanxietysolution.com.